Good evening. Before we start, I'd like to bow our heads. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to glorify your name and lift you up. Father, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to guide every single person here, including myself. Give us open minds and open hearts to your message of truth and of hope. I pray, Father, that you would please send your mighty angels around us to protect us from any distractions or anything that may try to deviate our attention to what you willed to speak through me. I pray, Father, that I would not be seen, but that you would take control and direct these next 30 minutes. And I just pray for your intervention. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so yes, my name is Daniel Varela, and I just wanted to start with my childhood. It's always a good place to start. That's really where our roots come from. I come from a Puerto Rican household, um, second generation Puerto Rican. My father was in the military for 20 years, and I come from family with Christian values. Um, Christian, I put it in, in quotes because when I was very young, up until like eight or nine years old. My family wasn't, weren't the really the most devout Christians. Um, my father struggled with some habits of smoking and drinking and would go and there'd be some partying. And so um, because of the inconsistency in the household, I believe that was part of the reason why I would um, just kind of see a lot of different spiritual things. I like see demons sometimes and had these like spiritual encounters where it left me a little bit confused and also impressed upon my mind that there is a spiritual world and yet I wasn't sure what that really looked like. But we did believe in God and that was known to me. Like most families, they're all fa there's no perfect family. So there are strengths and challenges that we had to face and I would like to start with the challenges to then, you know, really echo the strengths. I do believe my parents tried the best that they could. And I, you know, have had to do a lot of work on not blaming them, but also taking responsibility and holding room for the hurts that I had experienced. But some of the challenges for me growing up were uh, culture challenges, uh, being second generation Puerto Rican, kind of felt very like, I also grew up in the South, so I'm not black, I'm not white, so where do I really fit in? Um, Puerto Ricans from the island wouldn't necessarily claim me because I wasn't born and raised there, definitely Americanized, so kind of left me feeling like, okay, so who am I? I, would ask, I remember asking my mom, like, so who am I? Like, what do, what do I say? I'm not black, I'm not white, but I'm not really born and raised in Puerto Rico. So it was kind of another layer of confusion. And then also the machismo dominant culture in the Latino culture, as well as, you know, in the Southern culture, we're in US America. Um, I kind of felt a lot of shame for not measuring up to like boyhood expectations, not being overly, um, you know, macho, like into sports, the way I carried myself um, being empathetic wasn't necessarily seen as valuable as a boy, so I felt a lot of shame about like being myself. And I also had emotional needs. And you know, in the Latino culture, in you know, the Southern culture, being vulnerable as a boy is kind of, it can be seen as strange, although things are changing now. Um, those were some barriers that, I, that kept me from wanting to connect with my family. And on top of that, um, we get to the same-sex attraction. Um, ever since I could remember, I just had an inclination to the same sex. Um, I know there's people say, oh, being born this way, that, that's not true. You know, there's no gay gene that, that disapproves of that. Mind you, we're all born into a sinful world and we all have sinful inclinations that need to be put it's crucified on a daily basis and we need to be reborn again. So that was kind of the work that God was working on me and we'll get into that in just a minute. But those are some of the challenges. Some of my stre the strengths in the family, my basic life needs were always met. 
always had food on the table, there was always shelter, there was always clothes. Um, I forgot to add on their gifts. My parents did a great job at reinforce, doing positive reinforcement. If you know, we did well, they'd you know, give us a reward and we'd go on vacations every year. That's not necessarily something that all, all, any family can always get, not all families get. So I can be grateful for that. There was exposure to God and both of my parents are hardworking. So those are some things that I would just try to stay focused on amidst the, some of the confusion. So seeds of hope. So the reason why I have this here um, to emphasize Romans 8.28 is really the message I want to bring out. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And um, just like any family, again, most marriages, I would say, have like some type of challenges they have to face, some things that aren't really going the most smoothly, at least at some point in the marriage. Um, and my parents are no exception to that. So I remember them having some issues, and even as a child, I, could, I would notice you know, some sadness, um, there being some separation, and I just kind of felt like, man, like this is not really going too well, and I started to have um, like anger towards my dad specifically, and just felt like he, you know, Woodley wasn't there as much, and I felt for my, for my mom, and um, I kind of was like, why didn't they just break up already? You know, like, it's not really working out. But one summer, my mom sent my sister and I to Puerto Rico and to her mother, which is my maternal grandmother. And she took us to church, my sister and I. And we went to church. We've gone to church before, but it really wasn't consistent enough to really say that we were really going. And I could sense a difference at this church. This was the Adventist church back where my grandma's from. And I had to get used to going there. And I saw people were nicer, kinder. There was something different about the ambience. And I started to really look forward to going to church. That was also a time where she would prepare all week for the Sabbath. We would, on the Sabbath, we would hang out with friends and church members. And it was a time of a lot of um, positivity. Like in my child mind, that's how I experienced um, consistent church going. So after that summer, we got back from Puerto Rico and I was thinking to myself in the airplane, like, man, this was really fun. Um, I had a good time, we went to the beach, my grandparents showed me the, the, the animals and, you know, church was really fun. And I kind of questioned within myself, like, I wonder what's gonna happen with that, because we don't really do that back at home. And it was as if God gave me like assurance, like, don't worry, I, I'm gonna take care of you. It's like a still small voice speaking to my heart. And I was just kind of like, okay, and just kind of let it be. So when we got back home, I noticed that the house changed. And my parents told me that um, they both forgave each other, and my mom specifically told me that God had helped them move forward together, and those were seeds that were like planted in my heart to let me know, okay, in my child mind, God is, not only is he real, I knew he existed, but he actually is able to do something, and he's able to do something positive, he's able to change things for the better. So by that time, after they reconciled, we started to go to church more consistently, and um, I would be more exposed to truth. And um, my household, once divided, seemed to be, have been reconciled. So despite that, we still face spiritual warfare. And just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're, you're not gonna face temptations, trip ups, challenges. In fact, there's probably gonna be a target. <laughs> on your back and that's just the, that's just the reality um can someone tell me how much time i have because i want to be mindful okay thank you so we face different types of spiritual warfare as a family um even though we were going to church more consistently there were still a lot of distractions as we see on the screen you know lots of watching different types of movies tv shows worldly music video games school just you know, kind of missing out on family 
devotions, um, not really being consistent in my own personal devotions. I wasn't really seeing what that looked like. So it was kind of like us hitting a wall. And you can see some other, you know, busyness. Being, my parents tried the best they can to work, provide, give us a better life than what they had. Um, and because of that, there was a natural disconnection. We didn't really have meals together. We just kind of eat whenever we ate. There was always food, but not really con family connection. Um, and then unconsecrated associates. So about age eight, uh, my family had my sister and I stay with this one family, and they weren't really Christian. They said they were, but they weren't really um, consecrated, just to put it that way. And um, they had four sons and one daughter. And one, one day, uh, the oldest son basically was like, hey, can I show you something? And you know, I'm like eight, so I'm curious to know what he wants to show me. And I ended up seeing, was being exposed to pornography at that age. Um, and not only was that exposure kind of like troubling to me, I felt guilt for seeing that, um, but I noticed that I was more drawn to the male than the female. And I felt like I just, and the whole new world was open to me. And from that point on, I just kind of started to try to push away some of those um, promiscuous feelings that I had because of the exposure that I had. Um, and I now know that's considered child sexual abuse, even when you are exposed to porn, and it's something that's happening quite frequently these days. So I think it's, you know, it's important that we're being mindful of that. So on top of that, I knew over time, in my culture, being gay or labeling yourself as LGBTQ is not, <laughs> you don't do that. <laughs> like that, there's like a lot of shame, especially in like the Caribbean culture around same-sex attraction. So there was that layer of, okay, awareness. I, ha I have these feelings towards other boys. I know my family does not approve of it. Based on some of the things that they said, whether it be unintentional or not, uh, there was a lot of negative things said about that community, so I knew that they were not going to approve of this thing that I was struggling with. But at the same time, I was like, well, let me just pray about this then, because, you know, that's what we do in church. We pray and we ask God to help us. So I would, you know, throughout my oh, eight, since I was eight years old, through middle school and high school, mainly in middle school, I would pray a lot, like, okay, God, please take this away from me. I would ask God to please give me attractions for women so I can just like girls, like maybe that's what's supposed to happen. And um, I started to have like a displaced anger to God because I'm like, God, like, why aren't you changing me? Like, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be lost. I want to serve you. And so over time, I became ashamed, alone, and depressed. Honestly, if I can describe how I felt in, inside most of the time, that's how it was. Mind you, um, I didn't say this, but my father is third generation Adventist, my mom is second generation Adventist, and so I technically grew up in the church. I was going to Pathfinders, I was an adventurer, I played special music, I played the violin up front, I would read scripture. So it's not like I was one of those who were on the outside. So I knew and I trusted what the Bible said about homosexuality, but I just didn't know what, I didn't have any help. I didn't know what to do. If you were to say anything, it was pretty shameful. So I just kept it all inside. So basically started to have really evil thinking. And this quote really encompasses what that looks like. Um, and you guys can just read it on your own, but I'll just briefly mention I had a lot of resentment, I had a lot of anger, I had a lot of envy. Like I would, at one point, I would see heterosexual couples and get so bitter and so angry at God. Like, why are they able to have that and I naturally feel this way and I can't have that for me? And just, again, just meditating on not, not the word of God. This quote basically talks about when we focus on you know positive thoughts the truth god's word that's what it is that's going to empower our character to be more like christ 
I did not know that as a child. I did not, I, but didn't know to, how to meditate on the Word of God, how to have a deep relationship with the Lord. So I was becoming futile in my thinking, and I was um, addicted to pornography. Um, I remember at one point, I got 12 years old, um, I masturbated like five times once, and I felt the Holy Spirit, like I couldn't stop. It was just very chronic, and it was pretty severe. And the Holy Spirit like convicted me at 12 and was like, Daniel, if you don't stop, it's going to get worse. You need to stop. And I didn't know what to do, so I kept it inside. And so I struggled with that habit all throughout my college years. And at this point, um, I got to the point where I got tired of like struggling you know, with this and praying about it and praying about it and nothing happening. So I was like, you know what, clearly I just need to accept it for what it is and this is who I am, in quotes, because that's, that's not who I am, it's just an inclination that's, that was there. Um, and I just felt like I needed to find out how to merge my faith without, you know, or merge my sexuality without God. Um, I experienced a lot of shame. I, the first day on this Christian campus that I went to, I went to a Christian university, um, somebody basically called me a gay slur. And I thought it was really childish. Um, I thought, wow, like we're in college. This is, feels very like high school. And so I was telling a friend about it and they ended up getting me connected to like an underground gay group that was on campus. And I received exposure to the gay culture in a way that I hadn't received before. Um, I received acceptance. I received feeling vulnerable in such a way that I hadn't ever experience and it fulfilled the emotional need that I had lacked since I was a child so I was really appreciative of that part but the parts that I didn't really receive well from that group was being exposed to some drugs and um, as well as hookup culture and I ended up you know learning kind of the lingo and the different types of like subgroups in that community and was becoming assimilated to that culture and um, the more I indulge, you know, if you do one sin, all these other sins come along with it. You don't just do one, you do multiple. And then, again, I can see how the devil was um, really discouraging me, really wanting to create more mess in my life. And I could tell that I was becoming dull to the voice of God and was becoming, you know, just really, really darkened, like it talks about in Romans 1, which says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's honestly the path that I was headed inwardly. So basically, I thought, well, maybe I can be homosexual and Christian, like people like that exist. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, maybe there's people out there, I, I'm sure there's people out there that are more intellectual than myself, but I could never finagle the Word of God. I personally couldn't really justify like the Greek and the Hebrew and uh, the boy slave versus an adult. That was too much for me. I couldn't personally, this is just me, I couldn't really justify that the Bible affirms active homosexuality, so participating in the, in the actions of homosexuality. So the Holy Spirit was really still convicting me, like, Daniel, there's more, like, you know, I'm here for you. God would affirm me, like, Daniel, I love you no matter what. I love you, I love you. So I knew that God loved me, but I didn't know what to do with this thing in my heart, in my flesh. And so at some point, I had a boyfriend. <laughs> I was on a Christian campus. We did not openly say this, so, you know, we were just roommates. And um, the minute I got in that relationship, the Holy Spirit was coming after me. God, I would hear God say, Daniel, this is not my plan for you. And I'd be like, well, God, I don't know what to do. Help me. You know, like he has everything that I want and I, you haven't changed me, so I don't really know what to do. And over time, I started to feel more grieved and more sad. 
And a lot of times we want affirmation. We want people that, to tell us, oh, it's okay. You know, don't worry, you can just continue. It's fine, God loves you. But you know what? It's okay sometimes to be grieved. It's okay to be sad sometimes. Like it says in Ecclesiastes 7.3, sorrow is better than laughter for a sad countenance is good for the heart. Referring to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.9, says, and now I rejoice, not because you were made sorrowful, but because your sorrow led you to repentance, for you felt the sorrow that God had intended. And so we're not harmed in any way by us. There's more context to that chapter, but I was experiencing a type of sorrow that I could not shake. And personally, I wasn't gonna finagle the Bible to make it fit a narrative that was going against the Holy Spirit's voice that was in my heart, because God lives in every single person that believes in God, and he will tell us and give us discernment if we're open to his will. And I believe that's what was going on in my life. But I was living in sin. So I was in this relationship with a guy, and um, God was, he, he was starting to question the path I was headed. I remember one time um, I was at the club, and literally in the middle of the dance floor, God was like, Daniel, who are you right now? And I was like, okay, like, I was acting out of character. God was calling me out because I even felt like I was becoming who I thought, what I thought it meant to be homosexual. And God was questioning me. Also, I was receiving warnings. Sometimes God would um, send certain people my way to tell me, hey, um, you're headed in the wrong direction. And they would do so in such a loving and compassionate way that it, it had me think even more. Like it says in Isaiah 118, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. He wants us to reason with him at his word to overcome sin. And so at some point I was like, okay, God is chasing after me. He's telling me this is wrong. Maybe I need to really spend some time with him and get to know him more because clearly he's not the one, he's not someone who hates me like how I thought because he's trying to come near me, even in my sin. And so I started to pray more and read the Bible. And God was really wooing me in with his love through the book of Psalms. He was showing me that, hey, like, it's okay to be emotional. I made you in my image. And yes, you're a boy, you're a guy, but this, I made you this way. You need to come to me with these things. And so he was affirming me in the ways that I, I was looking for in my friendships and in the lifestyle. And so basically, I hit a crossroads. And I know I have three minutes, so we will take some, take some time because they're letting me know keep going. All right, praise the Lord. Yes, I'm trying to do it justice, but, you know, I understand there, there's some time constraints, and I want to respect that. But Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, or God and sin, however you want to put it. So... There was one experience that I had where my partner's boyfriend came to visit. And when he came to visit, uh, my partner's brother, I hope I said that right. So he came to visit and um, I was cooking. <laughs> and at this point I had a consistent devotional life. So I was really growing in such a way that I was craving more of God while also living in sin. Um, my boyfriend's brother was telling me his life problems and I ended up giving him godly advice. And when I did that, it, I grieved the Holy Spirit. And I felt very sad. And God was like, how are you going to give somebody godly counsel when you are not fully committed to me? And I was, whew, I was like, oh, wow. And so I stopped cooking and I went upstairs and I got on my knees and I was like, Father, I am so sorry. I know I'm living a double life. I know I need help. I don't know what to do. And then I asked God, I believe this was, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I asked him, I said, Lord, can you please, please show me what my life would look like if I were to stay with a man? But when I prayed that, I knew he was not going to go against his word. And I may need to see what, how 
dishonoring it would be if I were to stay in that lifestyle. Now, I'm not encouraging being presumptuous. My unbelief kept me from trusting God at his word. And so I want to be able to follow God at his word, even if it doesn't make sense, even in my heart, in my own humanity. Um, but that's where I was, and God actually honored that prayer. Um, two weeks later, I was at a work trip, and I decided to explore the city. When I got there, um, I was like, oh, I, you know what, let me meet, these two, let me meet some people at this um, bar, and um, they seemed like a commendable couple, they were a homosexual couple, so I pray and read the Bible before going there. I felt like I was being blasphemous, and I was like, oh, Lord, I know I'm not just blasphemous, oh, but I want you to come with me. <laughs> I asked God to come with me. So it was just a regular bar, yeah, but it happened to be, you know, a gay couple there. So we get there, I get there, and th the car is the same make and model as the car that my partner had at the time. And the Holy Spirit was like, this is the car of the people that you're going to meet. And when he said that, I knew, okay, he, God is answering my prayer. He's showing me what my life could look like. So uh, when I get inside, it's as if I'm seeing myself like 20 years ahead. Like we had the same personality. He was well-spoken. He was Latino. He kind of even looked like my dad a bit, who I look like my dad. And um, so I'm like, wow, that's crazy. And then his partner reminded me of my partner. And like they even looked alike. And again, same personality, same way of being. And we ended up going to their house and we were talking in their patio. Oh, by the way, it was their car. And I knew that God was answering my prayer. So in my mind, I'm like, I need to go ahead and make an assessment. I need to assess what life that they're living just to see if I want to live that way because it's my choice. So I went ahead and was talking with them and they were telling me about their life. They were like, yeah, you know, like, uh, first they started off with telling me like their income, like they're, they were both, they were working for computers or something like that. And they were saying how they learned how to work their way up. They were both came from like poorer families, but they were millionaires at this point. And in my head, I'm like, oh, that's, that's nice. You know, that would be nice to be at that place. Oh, okay. I was asking for tips and stuff. Um, and then they were telling me, yeah, but we were monogamous, but then we ended up having an open relationship, which, you know, wasn't my original plan, but it's kind of where we, where we started, what we ended up doing. And then I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, oh, that's not really a good thing. I don't want that. And, um, you know, they're telling me in general how their life is. The younger partner goes inside. And then it leaves me with the older gentleman who reminds me of me like 20 years down the road. And he's like, so what do you like about your partner? Tell me about him. And I'm like, well, I like everything in him. He's really kind, you know, he's loving, hardworking. And the Holy Spirit is like, you need to tell him your doubts. And I'm like, oh my gosh, God, like right now? And he was like, right now? And I'm like, so yeah, he, even though I like him, um, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, I'm Seventh-day Adventist, um, and I believe what the Bible has to say about homosexuality, and so I don't know if I should be with him. And he was like, oh, you know, it's crazy, because when I was exactly your age, I used to be a Seventh-day Adventist, and I decided to leave the faith so I can live as a homosexual. And I was like, oh, wow. So he basically ended up telling me his um, testimony, how some Adventist missionaries came to where he's from, and he fell in love with God. And he ended up telling his pastor at 21, because at the time I was 21, he told his pastor, hey, pastor, um, I'm struggling with homosexual feelings. Like, what do I do? And the pastor was like, it's not a sin to struggle with that inclination, but you just can't act it out. And so... When he, when he was told that, he said he felt very upset and he just felt like it wasn't fair. So he ended up just deciding to live, his, live out his life. And then he started to try to persuade me, like, you know, like, look at our life, like, we're successful. Like, when you're LGBTQ, like, you know people at the top and companies and you can network and it's really, it's really a comfortable life. And, but the other things they were telling me in my heart, I'm like, but this is not honoring God. Like, this is not in alignment with the word of God. Like, I would much rather suffer 80 years in this earth if I even get to that point and then live in eternity with my father in heaven who he owns everything and I'm going to live in a city of gold and I'm going to live for, like, it does not compare. So, 
So I just I already had that in my heart because God had wooed me in with his love. So basically at that point on, I decided to, I broke it off with my boyfriend literally after the trip and God started to provide all of my needs. And I'm trying to respect you guys' time. So where are we? Thank you. All right, five more minutes. So I yeah, broke it up with him. Side note, he actually is a pastor's kid. So he, he actually respected me for my decision. And, um, you know, we just parted ways. The next thing that God wanted to address in my heart that was occupying space um, was the lust addiction that I had been struggling with since I was exposed to porn at eight. And um, he got me connected to a men's group, an accountability group, 12 step, and I started to learn the tools on how to, you know, be in recovery and started to experience God's healing simply by praying, claiming the word of God, um, and praying with other people. God brought me new godly people to pray in group, and God started to convict me about how I lived my life. Um, he started to convict me about the song, the music I was listening to, the, the clothes I was wearing, and he actually started to convict me about eating, not eating meat. I did not grow up in a vegetarian family, um, but God at this point, at that point, had convicted me about letting that go because it's just kind of heavy on me, and he wanted me to be clean, or more clean. So um, I just started to learn to live for God. Meanwhile, still has same sense of attraction, but God was prioritizing what he wanted to prioritize for me. So I already shared some of that. I also went to counseling. I'm a proponent for, for Christian counseling. Um, even though some people market themselves as Christian counselors, you would want to be sure that they're still in alignment with the word of God and always be prayerful about, you know, who you are looking for to do that. But I needed to process my trauma and be able to make amends with it and move forward. Um, so I started to learn to walk in the narrow way. It says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So I was learning how to walk in the way. Learning to stay connected to God from the heart and be connected to him and overcome self-love, self-indulgence, and temptation to sin. So God was showing me what that looked like on a daily basis, and I was thriving. I was starting to have the mind of Christ. I was always claiming Romans 12 too. Lord, teach me, please. Like I'd get these just wicked thoughts of wanting to do evil, of wanting to go back and do like drink or go to the club. And I'm like, I don't want to think that way. Like, I want to think, I want to be holy. I want to be set apart. I want to be restored. Like, I need your help, God. I can't do this. And he started to really grant me that. And so by this point, um, I'm going to rush these next couple of things. I think it's really beautiful how God turns things around. Um, so he basically started, I started to challenge him. And like, God, everything in my life is changing. Yet, what about the same sense of attraction? Like, what are we going to do with that? And I have good relationships with my family, good relationships with myself, good relationships with godly men. What do I do? I'm still feeling lonely. I still want relational intimacy. And so God started to challenge me on that and be like, you know, I'm the God of the impossible, right? And I'd be like, yes, you know, I'm the God of the impossible, of the impossible right? Like a couple weeks later, I'm like, yes. And then he said, pray for a wife. And I was like, but God, <laughs> how? How are you going to make a habit? There's these, you know, beautiful Adventist girls at my church that I don't really like that much. So how, who is going to, who are you going to pick? Who are, what's, what's going on? So um, basically, if you have to listen to the testimony that were recorded for CTL3 to get more details, but to fast track it, um, yeah, God basically has uh, brought a girlfriend in, into my life who's a godly woman who loves the Lord. I have genuine um, sexual attractions towards her, should you care to know. And <laughs> it's real. And I didn't think that was possible. I wasn't trying to change you. I'm just, hey, I'm not, I wasn't trying to force it. I was all about, let's be organic, Lord. I want to make sure that that is there. Because you're not just marrying your BFF. You're marrying your wife in this one flesh. So it's, it's not just friends. So, um, yeah, God has just been doing a, a lot more than I thought he could ever do. Um, and I just want to give him glory for his love, his restoration. And I know there's still more to come, and I want to respect your time. So thank you for your attention, and I hope this enriched your faith.